Hello, um, welcome back to the Marshall. Anyway, today we are gonna watch uh, a video by History Matters. Uh, his, uh, the video is about the German unification and the German Empire. Now that's a subject I actually have read a lot about and I am really excited to go into it. Of course, uh, check out the original video in the description before you watch this reaction. Uh, of course, full credit to him. Uh, yeah, and please, if you like this video, like and subscribe to like and subscribe it. Anyway, let's uh, let's watch the video. 1805, and the Austrian army is on the march against Napoleon. It didn't go great. The man leading this army was Francis II, the Holy Roman Emperor. He was also the Emperor of Austria, a title he created in. Uh, no, um, he didn't lead the army at the Battle of Auschwitz. Remember. Yes, the, the Emperor of Austria was there, but the Emperor of Russia, Alexander I, was also there. And there were, and I'm pretty sure there were more Russian soldiers than Austrian soldiers, because the most of the Austrian soldiers uh, had been lost at Ulm just a couple of months prior, back in o uh, October. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I did. I am pretty. It was actually. I'm pretty sure it was my Mikhail Kutuzov and the Russian emperor that primarily led the armies at Austerlitz. So yeah, I don't know if he if he was responsible for that defeat exactly uh, at Austerlitz. Response to Napoleon declaring himself the emperor of France because he wasn't about to be out emperored by anyone. So as far as empires go, the Austrian Empire was fairly run of the mill. The Holy Roman Empire, however, was not so normal. It was comprised of hundreds of mostly German-speaking states who swore allegiance to an emperor. The most powerful state in the Holy Roman Empire was Austria, followed by Prussia, and both of these had territory inside. So the Holy Roman Empo Empire, I love the quote, the famous quote from um, Voltaire, you know, uh, the Holy Roman Empire is neither holy, Roman, or an empire. Um, uh, is in, um, yeah. Uh, it, it is a old medieval state that was for some time actually in medieval age quite powerful but over time especially after the peace at um, Westphalia Westphalia after um, the 30 years war it became incredibly decentralized individual states declared war against each other all the time the seven years war of course where Prussia invades <laughs> Saxony and all sorts of things and there's no centralized leadership or the very little very little centralized leadership at the very least and yeah it was a doomed failed system that of course i'm for sure he's gonna get to this but napoleon would kill it in 1805 and outside of the empire because it was complicated Having been defeated by Napoleon, Francis gave up his title of Holy Roman Emperor, and the Holy Roman Empire itself was dissolved in 1806. Most of its former states, except notably Prussia and Austria, were brought into the Confederation of the Rhine, which was the French. So the Confederation of the Rhine, essentially, Napoleon wants protection against the other nations like Austria and Prussia, and Russia, who he's still at war with at this time, Russia. And Sweden had not gone out of the war, and of course, Great Britain is also there. So he wants a buffer state, and he makes the Confederation of Rhine, Rhine with himself as protector. It, uh, the Confederation is not only a buffer, it also gives him extra soldiers. I think around 60,000 or 80,000 soldiers, somewhere in between that, uh, German soldiers would serve in his army because of it. And it, and it was essentially many of the states that had helped him in 1805 got more territory, like Bavaria, for example, became kingdoms, for example. And it was so it was essentially the successor to the Holy Roman Empire under Napoleon's leadership. Which puppet state. The people that lived in these states were somewhat unhappy living under the dominance of France, and many quickly began to resent everything French. One way to counter French influence was to emphasize just how German they were. So, side note, the term German was used to refer to people that spoke German. There were Germans, but no Germany. In some respects, there was a sense of shared identity and culture, but Germans were also very divided by religion, economics and politics. So, long story short, after Napoleon had been defeated by the Russians, Prussia and Austria rose up against him, and by 1815 he had been firmly defeated. 
After Napoleon's defeat, the Congress of Vienna was called to establish and maintain a balance of power so that no country could become too powerful. This balance of power is known as the Concert of Europe. A man called Clemens von Metternich was very important to the establishment of this new order. Metternich was an Austrian diplomat who was instrumental in protecting Austria from Napoleon's harsher punishments. As a result of the Congress, Prussia gained this territory, most notably the Rhineland, and Austria gained this territory in Italy but lost the Austrian Netherlands. Import so, very important here for the unification of Germany is that Napo the French Revolution had kind of, I suppose, cemented uh, nationalism and liberalism in France, and it kind of created it in France and in, uh, in France the ideas of nationalism and liberalism. And then Napoleon, as emperor, exports the ideas all over Europe. Not only that, but he kinda, I, how, how should I say it? He kinda amplified it, I suppose, in nations like Germany and Italy because he controlled them. So that basically means that in opposition to the French, Germans and Italians began to unite themselves against the French. Like read something like, I think it's called An mein Volk. You know, the, um, uh, the declaration from the Prussian king, Frederick William III, uh, at the beginning of the German Liberation War, is appealing to nationalism, the German identity, to rally the Germans against Napoleon. So now nationalism is growing in Germany and Italy and all over Europe, actually, in opposition against the French. And that nationalism and I, and idea, and idea live and that idea of liberalism will continue to be there after Napoleon is gone and will eventually be the uniting factor uh, for Germany. Importantly, the German Confederation was formed. It was led by a president who was also the Emperor of Austria, had these borders which included some of Prussia and Austria but not all of Prussia and Austria, but was also totally not the Holy Roman Empire under a different name. The German Confederation was quite a loose alliance and as such was seen as quite weak in comparison to other powers such as France and Russia. This led to some calls for political unification which would help protect the smaller German states and prevent a repeat of Napoleon. Prussia was keen on the idea of German unification because it being the largest German He makes a really great point here that they want protection from other nations because, you know, they have just been invaded by Napoleon. So that, that growing nationalism that helped to defeat Napoleon wants to prevent it ever happening again to Germany by uniting Germany. German state would be in charge. In 1819, Prussia formed the Zollverein, which was a customs and trading union which sought to make commerce between German states easier. This was not just an economic union. Austria was excluded from joining, which meant that there was no economic counterbalance to Prussia, and by 1848, the Zollverein looked like this. So essentially, in this time period, you need to imagine this is a time period, a time where a lot of things is happening in the world. The steam train, the steam engine has just been invented. Railways are being built in Germany around this time. So now travel becomes much in 18, in the 1840s and 50s, travel from one end of Germany to another is, it becomes more and more easy. So suddenly regional, uh, I suppose, differences are slowly being eroded away because suddenly you can go from one end of Germany to another in a matter of hours. Now I get we aren't really there yet in the video, but still it's kind of beginning to happen, uh, happen around this time. Throughout the early 19th century, liberal ideas were spreading throughout the continent and the new middle class wanted reform, such as political representation and freedom of speech. In Austria, these calls for reform had been repressed by Metternich via censorship and prosecution. The cries for reform continued to grow and in 1848 riots broke out across the German Confederation and Austria. In Austria, the reforms were short-lived, but Metternich was forced to resign and fled to Britain. Riots in Berlin were suppressed by Prince Wilhelm of Prussia via cannons, which earned him the nickname the Prince of Grapeshot. So the King of Prussia, Friedrich Wilhelm IV, begrudgingly agreed to the establishment of a parliament which could advise him. The liberal factions involved in the rioting believed that the best way to secure these reforms was via a unified Germany. As such, liberals across the German Confederation called the Frankfurt Parliament, which planned to unify Germany and declare Friedrich Wilhelm IV as its emperor. He said no, and by late 1849... Yes, he said no. He said no to, um, to becoming emperor, and that's because he did not want a... It, according to himself, he said that he did not want a throne uh, or, or imperial crown given to him by the by the people, by the normal people. He did not want that. 
So um, he very much said no to it. And um, of course, uh, 1848, more, uh, 1848, by the way, it wasn't just Germany that was hit by 1848. Uh, in 1848, every nation in Europe basically had some kind of liberal uprising. Uh, France had a very serious one. That would have, that would, it would result in the July monarchy ending, republic being declared, and then an empire under Napoleon III later on. And all sorts of nations begins to write constitutions. My, my home country of Denmark, um, wrote our constitution in 1849 because of, um, protest that had happened the year before in um, 1848 so every nation is being hit by this by this massive european-wide revol- liberal and nationalistic revolutions that happen and the reform movement had died down most of the reforms implemented by the frankfurt parliament were quickly abandoned but the idea of a unified germany persisted there were two proposals for a unified German state, Klein Deutschland, which means small Germany, and Gross Deutschland, which means large Germany. The difference was that Gross Deutschland included the German-speaking parts of the Austrian Empire, whereas Klein Deutschland did not. This idea of a shared ethnic, cultural and linguistic heritage or destination is an important part of nationalism. For more homo- So essentially, the Prussians, is very clear, right? The Prussians want Klein Deutschland because that excludes Austria, so they dominate the German world. But many states, particularly the ones in the south, Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden, they want Großdeutschland, which includes Austria, because, as he said previously, the southern German states are much different from the north German states. They are more Catholic, more aligned uh, economically and politically and culturally with Austria, so they want Austria included. But Prussia doesn't want that because they want to dominate Germany alone. Modernist places like Germany or Italy, nationalism was a uniting factor. For ethnically diverse empires such as Russia or Austria, it was a destabilizing force. For example, in Austria, the Hungarians attempted to break away in 1848, but this was prevented due to intervention from the Russians. The Austrians were opposed to a unified Germany which they weren't in charge of. Austria wasn't the only opponent of a unified Germany, France and Russia were quite nervous about the idea as well. Austria was able to rely on Russian pressure to dissuade the Prussians from pursuing Klein Deutschland and maintain the German Confederation. Russian support for Austria ended in 1854 when Austria refused to help Russia in the Crimean War against Britain, France and the Ottoman Empire. A few years later, Austria was defeated by France and Sardinia and thus lost this territory in northern Italy. Whilst Austria was, that was weakening... The, that was the Italian... Uh, the, I think it was the second, right? The second war of Italian independence. Napoleon III comes to power in, in France in 1849, I think. I'm, no, 1848. I'm pretty sure it, hadn't, it was still 1848 by that time. Um, 1848. And um, he eventually, I think it was in 1852, I think, he declares himself emperor and reestablish uh, the French Empire. And he supports Italian unification, so he goes to war with, with Piedmont Sardinia against Austria. The famous Battle of Solferino, of course, happened there. Um, very bloody. And would, was so bloody, in fact, that it resulted in the Red Cross being established. Uh, yeah, but it didn't really lead to the swift unification. But it would eventually come for Italy. And Prussia found itself gaining strength. Prussia was rapidly industrializing, had access to a great amount of natural resources such as coal, and was a major producer of iron. The Solverine also allowed Prussia to export these products, and its economy grew in strength. So in 1861, Friedrich Wilhelm died and was succeeded by his brother, Wilhelm I, the aforementioned Prince of Grapeshot. The next year, he appointed a man called Otto von Bismarck as the Minister-President of Prussia. Bismarck was a very gifted statesman and firmly opposed to the liberal forces in Prussia. He sought to unify the northern German states, remove Austria from the German Confederation, and strengthen the position and prestige of the Prussian king. One of the so um, yeah, he so essentially he wants nationalism, but he doesn't want liberalism. He wants to remove the liberal element of nationalism and just have a conservative nationalism, I suppose you can say, and. Um, yeah, of course, his famous speech where he, Iron and Blood, where he declares that 
The decisions of the day will not be decided by majority decisions. It will be decided by iron and blood. I think that's how the speech goes. Essentially, he says that 1848 and 49 have been a disaster because of the democratic principles and involved, and it would be united not through democracy or agreements. It will be united through war, and the, it will be made by the conservatives instead. Um, one of the first things he does actually is to, I'm pretty sure that he ignores the parliament, which doesn't want army reforms. He, and goes to the king directly and says, can we get an army, uh, expansion? Which he, he gets, even by going to the king directly, ignoring parliament. Uh, the, or I don't, I don't remember what it's actually called, but the Prussian parliament or government or whatever. The first things that Bismarck did was to modernize and increase the size of the Prussian military in case his plans led to war. This is the first broke out in 18. That was ignore the Reichstag. Yes, exactly. He, he goes to the king directly. I'm pretty sure that's somewhere in the Prussian constitution that the the parliament can be ignored if if the king wants to, essentially. In case his plans led to war, they did. The first broke out in 1864 after Denmark had declared that both Schleswig and Holstein were Danish territory. Holstein was in the German Confederation, and in retaliation, Prussia and Austria declared war on Denmark, which they quickly won. So, I always find it kind of funny that you kind of just skip over the Second Schleswig War, not because there's anything wrong with that, but it's just so funny because I'm Danish, and we hear a lot about the Second Schleswig War in our history, in our in our school. And it's always, in other YouTube channels, it's uh, just kind of glossed over. It's just a minor war. But it was a disaster for Denmark. It's just a complete disaster. <laughs> the Battle of Dübel was just... We just got o overrun and... Yeah. Uh, it was, we, hope, we were hoping that Britain and Russia would join us, but they didn't, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. Just a disaster in all ways. So, Prussia received Schleswig and Austria received Holstein. Austria was unhappy with the results of the war because the new territories were part of the Solver Rhine and Austria needed to... Oh, wait a second. Because the new territories were part of the Solver Rhine and Austria needed to... Austria received Holstein. Austria was unhappy with the results of the war because the new territories were part of the Solver Rhine and Austria needed to... received Holstein. Basically won. So, Prussia received Schleswig and Austria received Holstein. They switched them around. Holstein! Is the one to the south. Schleswig is the one to the north. I'm pretty sure. Right? So Prussia received Schleswig and Austria received Holstein. That's Holstein. That's Schleswig. It's the other way. I'm pretty sure it's the, it's the other way around. Austria was unhappy with the results of the war because the new territories were part of the Solver Rhine and Austria needed to travel through Prussian territory to get to its own. Bismarck knew that this arrangement would lead to war with Austria and so made sure that the other European nations stayed out of it. He made a defensive pact with the newly unified Kingdom of Italy on the condition that Italy would gain Veneto from Austria. He also, he promised that a tiny, a bit of territory here would go to France, for example, to keep France neutral. But he never made any concrete um, <clears throat> uh, agreement. So he of course broke the agreement or the, whatever, the hint or whatever, the, the vague promise to France and just went to war with them anyway. Anyway, yeah. He was also supportive of French and Russian ambitions to keep them neutral. Eventually, Austria tried to resolve the issue surrounding Holstein and Bismarck accused the Austrians of treating them like enemies. Prussian troops occupied Holstein in June 1866. Most of the German Confederation backed Austria and war broke out shortly afterwards. Fortunately for Prussia, the Italians mobilized on the Austrian border and declared war five days later. Prussia quickly defeated Austria's northern allies and Austria had lost the war within two months. One of the reasons for this was that Prussian troops were armed with a new type of rifle, the needle gun. The Austrians fared much better against the Italians, but their losses against Prussia led them to surrender. In the end, Prussia gained all of this territory, which became the North German Confederation with its own parliament. Austria also agreed to give up Veneto, but because they had generally outperformed the Italians, they gave it to France instead, who then gave it to Italy because 19th century war was weird. So, the rapid rise of Prussia was something that the French had not anticipated. In 1870, the German Prince Leopold, Wilhelm I's cousin, was offered the Spanish crown. The French Emperor, Napoleon III, did not want the North German Confederation to gain Spain as an ally and demanded that Wilhelm order his cousin not to take the crown. 
Wilhelm told the French he'll get back to them and so sent a telegram to Bismarck. Bismarck edited the telegram so it sounded like Wilhelm rudely brushed the French off and published it. This made the French look weak and silly so they declared war. So the French declaring war made them the aggressors and thus the Prussians were able to gain the support of the southern German states. So to summarise the war, the French couldn't mobilise as many men, the French Emperor was captured, the French had... He was captured as Sedan. Uh, well, all of the army, uh, pretty much all of the French army was surrounded. Not only that, but they would lay siege to Strasbourg, Metz, and eventually Paris, of course, which was a gigantic, and it was just a disaster from uh, there. Had another revolution because it was the 19th century, and so at this point, why not? The Germans pushed this far into French territory, and on the 18th of January, 1871, at the Palace of Versailles, the German leaders declared the creation of the German Empire with Wilhelm I as Emperor. The French soon after surrendered, agreeing to pay indemnities and giving Germany the territory of Alsace-Lorraine. So, one of the great... Which would be a huge uh, deal for France, uh, the loss of Alsace-Lorraine. So much events, so many events have been shaped by that. There comes, uh, in after the Franco-Prussian War, there comes like this hateful, paranoid culture in France against the Germans. They hate the Germans and are very paranoid of them. And that eventually leads to World War I because they want that territory back so much debates surrounding the German Empire as to what extent it was unification or simply Prussian dominance. The smaller German states felt that they were unable to protect themselves from their larger neighbours but in return for protection found themselves dominated by Prussia, except for Liechtenstein, which was fine. The dominance of Prussia is best seen through what is known as the Kulturkampf, the culture struggle. So northern Germany was mostly Protestant whilst the south had a large Catholic population. The Catholic Church had immense political authority and Bismarck wished to remove its influence and strengthen the central government. Catholic bishops were arrested en masse and Catholic institutions were sidelined, but ultimately it persevered. A unified Germany quickly became a great power. But ironically, when the Social Democrats uh, wins, I think they win, the, wins an election or something, Bismarck is forced to actually ally himself with the Catholics in desperation, in the hope that he doesn't lose his influence, which he eventually does anyway, uh, yeah. Power. Bismarck negotiated an alliance with the Austro-Hungarian Empire and managed to secure some African colonies by calling the Berlin Conference with the other European powers. It experienced a population boom alongside rapid industrialization and urbanization and also became a global centre of science. Wilhelm I died in 1888. He was replaced by Friedrich III, who died 99 days later, and he was followed by Wilhelm II. Wilhelm wanted to assert his own independence and so encouraged Bismarck to resign in 1890. Yes, he wanted a more aggressive foreign policy. Bismarck had tried actually to kind of make alliances with other states like Russia, Austria and that kind of, those kind of states in hopes of maintaining a general European uh, peace. But he wanted Weltpolitik, Kaiser Wilhelm II, essentially a more aggressive, more expansionist uh, uh, um, foreign policy. Unlike his predecessors, Wilhelm II was very hot-headed and prone to immediate reaction. He was also determined to increase the prestige of Germany. He did this by undertaking a major naval build-up in the early 20th century. This upset Britain. Britain had previously kept itself out of European affairs, but a large German navy posed a threat to its naval hegemony and could even threaten the British mainland. So, in 1914, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist and the established series of alliances and counter-alliances plunged Europe into World War I. Long story short, Germany was unable to break the stalemate that formed, its allies collapsed and a British blockade meant that a major food shortage occurred. War fatigue and hunger led many to protest and eventually revolt. Revolt became full-on revolution and Wilhelm abdicated on the 9th of November 1918. A republic was declared which soon after accepted the terms of the Treaty of Versailles which ultimately led to the conditions which precipitated the rise of the Nazi party. In conclusion, it's hard to overstate the effect of German unification. The rise of Prussia ended Austria's dominance over Central Europe and ushered in the end of the balance of power established at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. The strength of the new German Empire alongside its foreign policy paved the way for World War I and the new world which was left in its wake. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for- Well that was really good. I, I really, I always found, find this uh, subject very fascinating. But um, anyway, tell me what you think about it in the comments below, Subscri like and subscribe to the video and and of course, all credit to the original creator history uh, matters. I'm, I'm not trying to steal his content or anything. Um, yeah, uh, all credit to him, of course. Uh, and, you, and watch the original 
uh, video in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.